this time we'll have our children's church dismiss. And uh, in the meantime, those who are staying in this congregation, uh, Luke chapter 10, please, Luke chapter 10. And we're going to read verse 25 through verse 37. Whenever I read this story and this passage, it brings the remembrance of a little Bible my dad and mom gave to me. And it was a little storybook with all of the intricate drawings and on one page and the story on the next. And it was the little picture Bible. And as I would always come to him, I would hand him the story already open and tell my father, climb up on his knee and tell him to read me of the story of the sick man. And the Samaritan has always touched my heart. When I was young, my dad was called to go to Haiti as a missionary. And at the age of three, we began making preparations to leave the Pacific Northwest and go to a country. I had no clue what was happening. By the age of four, we were in Bahamas. And by the age of five, we were in Haiti for the next four and a half years. And I remember one of my friends, I was appalled at a person like us had so much. And you know, we talk about poverty in Canada. And I'm not being rude and I'm not being crude, but we have no clue what poverty means. None whatsoever. These folks would find a parcel of land and build a mud hut and stitch some thatchings together and that's where they would live. They didn't care whose land it was. They would sweep the dirt floor clean for the pastor to come. How do you sweep a dirt floor clean? And yet, they are the happiest people you could ever imagine. They did not look at you as being white. They did not look at themselves as being black. When they became Christians, you were brothers and sisters. They would walk for miles with no shoes on their feet to come to worship. And they did not worship to get out. They worshiped to get in. They would preach, and my father used to laugh and says, I can only preach a couple sermons in 100-degree weather. But they were like, preach, preach more, preach more. So you would have multiple preachers. And they didn't sing one or two or three songs like we do in North America, and then we're done. They sang until you didn't have any wind left. And then they'd sing some more. But one thing I learned from these people was their generosity. Generosity, which I do not see in North America. I don't care what race there is. Generosity like that, they would kill their own goat to feed the pastor, even if it's their very last one. They did not invite you over unless they had hospitality. They would put on their best pair of shorts, flip-flops, and whatever. I mean, it was like, wow, that was their best. But what touched my heart was a squatter next door. There was a little boy that his skin was dry and cracking. His belly was big for malnutrition. And he would come to our gate. And the house we rented was uh, another Haitian gentleman who lived in New York had a house and he rented it out and it had a gate around it and a fence. And he would come to the gate and watch my brother and I play pocket cars with the tattered shorts. And he would just stare at us. And he would ask us if he could come in. We'd swing the gates open and he would sit down and just play pocket cars and be in heaven. And one day he puts all the pocket cars down and he looks at it and walks away. And I looked at my brother Keith and I said, he doesn't have any pocket cars. He said, what are you going to give him some of yours? I said, I've got five. He's got none. So I asked, his name was Izuzu. Which pocket car would he like? And he picked my very favorite one. <laughs> and I'm like, <sighs> 
But I remember this story. And I remember this man gave all. His medicine, his donkey. And I gave it and one more to Izuzu. He went away. He was shouting at the top of his lungs, Mama, Mama, Gotti this. Gotti, look, look. And he goes, LeBlanc, that's what he called me, the white, gave me this car. And you know, it was so neat. And from then on, he started coming to our church. And 11 weeks later, on Easter Sunday, he walked the aisle as a six-year-old boy and got saved. And you know what the privilege was? My dad motioned to me. And my mom and I went in a room and I got to use my Bible and show him his need for the Savior. And this was, he was my friend. And then I realized every Sunday he came in the same shorts and the same t-shirt. Pepsi, sir. Now maybe that's why I like Pepsi to this day. He always, you know, indoctrination. So I took him up to my closet and I said, Mom, he and I are the same size. But the problem was his belly was bigger than mine. And mom altered his shirts so that he could wear some of my button shirts and my suit pants so he could come to church. And he came in the next Sunday morning beaming. But you know that family felt so obliged and obligated that they sewed doilies for my mother out of whatever they could find because they had to give something back. And I'm thinking we're living in a society where it's give me, give me, give me. I'm only thinking about my race, my creed, my this, my theology, my ideology. I don't care about anything else. The purpose of this Good Samaritan story is because Israel was in the same boat. If you weren't an Israelite of a certain this and a certain that, you were not well liked. The Lord asked this lawyer one question. When he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life he said what does the law say and he quotes it you shall love the lord thy god with all thy heart all thy soul and all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself here's the problem with this world they don't want to love god so how in the world are they going to love their neighbor if you do not have the love of god you will not see past your own nose you're going to see your own selfishness and your own desires and you're not going to see those that are around you all you're going to see is what you want to see. And that's exactly what the Levite and the priest did. They saw and they did not want to do anything about it. But the Samaritan is a perfect picture of the love Christ has for the world. And the love that we should have. If we love God with all our heart, we're going to love the same thing he loves. Amen? And that is mankind. I didn't care. You know, I've been here in Canada. I've been called a racist so many times by people that have a different ideology than me. They have no clue what a racist is. I grew up in a country where I was the only white person in church beside my parents. Didn't bother me. In fact, I loved it. I've had people run their hair, fingers through my hair, and call me Gotti Blanc. Gotti, look at the white, look at the white. I don't care. What I saw with Izuzu was my best friend for four years. He would do and we would do anything. We had one bike. We taught each other how to balance on a banana seat. Y'all remember the banana seats? At first he had no clue and we had a lot of spills. But it was fun. And then that bike became his bike when we left. And you know, it doesn't matter who we are. Who did God create you? God so loved the world. He created us. Individually and wonderfully made. And you know the Jews saw the Samaritans, the Romans, the dogs, the Gentiles, this. God saw the world. And this is where, what a wonderful story where he was trying to let this lawyer answer in his own question hang himself with his own noose per se, that 
who is the neighbor? And it choked him up so bad he couldn't even say Samaritan. The problem is sometimes we can't even admit to ourselves that we're selfish. But until we love the Lord, we will never have that sacrificial love. Through those two pocket cars, there is someone I have not seen since we left Haiti in 1981. But I know one day I'll see him. And three months later, roughly, his parents walked the aisle and got saved. I'm going to see that squatter family. I don't know their last names. If I did, I long forgot them. But I do know I can still remember a boy that made the best car sound I've ever heard as he pushed it through the dirt of Haiti. And his laugh was contagious. I can remember him so many things. First seeing Cheerios for the first time. He looked at it and poked at it like, what is this? And then we put applesauce on it. And next thing you know it, that whole box was being devoured by one little kid. We didn't realize the voracious appetite he had, but he spent many days at our table because he was my brother. He was my friend. If our nation would treat each other with that love and that compassion, there would be a world of difference in our world. But our government says we got to treat this class of person different than this class. Are we all not Canadians? I'm not a Norwegian, American, Scottish, Canadian. I'm Canadian. We're not anything else but we're one. And as the brothers and sisters south of us says one nation under God. And that's the way it should be. We are one person. Because we're one world according to the Lord. I saw something this week that I thought was really neat. And it said, it showed a red cloth blood bags. And it says, can you tell which one is a different nationality? They're all red. I don't know. I didn't ask. When I grabbed a bo bottle of blood out of the ambulance, I didn't say, well, um, nope. We just hooked it up, put the IV in and let it go. Folks, we need to get past who we are and what we are and see what God would have us be. As we look at the passage this morning in verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is it written in the law? How readest thou? What a good question. What's written and how do you interpret it? Look what he says. And he answer said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion on him, and he went to him and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he had departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves and he said he that showeth mercy on him then Jesus said unto him go and do thou likewise let us pray heavenly father we thank you for the privilege of being here this morning and be able to learn a little bit more about your way your compassion your love for all of mankind lord help us to have the heart of God but in order to have the heart of God O oh lord Help us to know that our name is in the Lamb's book of life. 
that our sins have been covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. And we have accepted and repented and became his child. Lord, I ask you that you'd help us to look beyond our situation, our circumstances, our schedule, and see the lost and dying world around us. That they need help. Not only physically, but mostly spiritual. They need the Lord and help us to be the light, having the compassion of Jesus Christ in our heart flowing forth into the world so desperately need of God's love. Thank you for all you've done for us. Use this word, I pray, to challenge us for these days ahead. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This story deals with love. And everywhere you look in the Word of God, you will see God's love. Everywhere you look in the New Testament, you see Christ's love. And this is where the Bible says Christ was an example to us. Did Jesus turn anyone away from Him? No. Look at the, the crowd was so pressed that they couldn't even get in to bring their friend and the four men tore a roof off to lower the friend down and Jesus didn't say ah, great inconvenience to my message no he stopped what he did and he healed that man on the way to the temple he heals the blind man on the way to the temple he heals the lame man on the way everywhere Christ heals the people and it's not just a physical healing it's a spiritual healing because he says, what shall I say? Go, thy sins be forgiven, or make, get up thy bed and walk. You know, Jesus was saying it was the belief and faith in him. Everywhere. You know, the disciples could not figure out and wrap their head around why Jesus was talking to this woman of ill repute at the well. You can see their indignation as they... Who's this woman? Jesus had a point. He must needs go through Samaria. Samaritans were not loved by the Jews at all. They were the least favorite people because they were half-breeds. And the Jews disliked them. They would walk all the way around so they wouldn't go through Samaria. But Jesus must needs to go Samaria. Do you find it ironic? Not a bit. When Jesus says in Acts 1.8 to go into all the world, but before he mentioned Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Because the Jews would probably conveniently forget to go to that area. Well, they don't need the Lord. And did you notice that after Paul began persecution, you find Philip, out of all the places they were scattered, Jesus records that Philip had a great revival in Samaria. This is what happens when we think we know what's right. And this is where we live in a society here where our government does such a great job of trying to split into classes. Stop splitting in classes. We all need the Lord. We all need help. Sin has affected us all. But see, what government says, the first class they want to split is, let's get rid of God. So they make us sound like as Christians, like we're just an abnormality. We're not abnormal people. We're the normal people. Amen. You know, I had somebody tell me, you're just brainwashed. And I had to laugh. I really did. On her jacket at a store that wears orange, there was pins for everything. There was a flag. There was this. There was the peace symbol. There was, I mean, it was littered with pins. And I'm brainwashed. Because I believe in God. They had PETA. They had this, you know. I believe in ethical treatment of animals. But I also believe that God gave us the animals to eat too. You know, this is the thing is, we have all this, and I had to answer, I was brainwashed. And I looked and I smiled and I said, some people more than others. But I said, my brainwashing was a heart washing first. And she goes, Pfft. you know, Christ washed my heart. Amen. 
He didn't force me. Christ never forced anyone to accept him. Look at the ten lepers. Only one came back and said thank you. Wasn't that they were healed of the most vile disease in all the country, and only one came back and said, thank you, Lord. That's our world today. Give me, give me, give me, and I'm just going to leave it. To the Jew, the question of the lawyer was the most important one. The word neighbor could be spoken in a breath, but unwind the word in the Jewish nation, and it measures off the whole of our earthly life. Their neighbor was used loosely to who they liked. Sound familiar today? But if the Jew could not erase the broad word from the pages of the law, he could narrow it and alter its meaning by an interpretation of his own liking. That's why Jesus says, what do you see it as? And he's like, well, the neighbor means a Jew. A neighbor means a scholar. A neighbor means one like me, but not a Samaritan. So here's Jesus using the word Samaritan as the one that had the greatest mercy and love and compassion. But you notice that the word never mentions parable. Many theologians believe, and I, I tend to believe, that this story was not really a parable, but a true event. One that they heard and knew of, and Jesus used it as a reference to remind them of a current event that convicted them, and he said, the Samaritan. Because we know the Pharisees were that way because the Pharisees looked and said, I'm so glad I'm not the, like this publican. The publican was praying who could not even lift his head, realize the vile sinner he was, and he says, forgive me. And the Pharisees are like, Lord, I'm so glad I can do this and that. With pride and a puffed heart. To the Jews and their mind, neighbor was simply a Jew. Not a Roman not a Greek, and heaven forbid, not even a Samaritan. The only neighborhood they recognized was the narrow neighborhood of the Hebrew speech and Hebrew sympathies. The Hebrew mind was isolated as their land to only look at their fellow neighbors. Jesus, however, was wise to their thoughts and ways of, because he was a Jew, and how wisely he answers. He does not declaim against the narrowness of the Hebrew thought. He utters no ill word against their proud and false exclusiveness in this we should learn how to answer in a debate allowing the holy spirit to convict the heart not us in our wisdom do you notice he didn't say now i disagree with this he said did you guys read in the paper did you not see the event here a while ago there was a certain man that was on the way down the bible doesn't say if it was a jew if it was a gentile if it was a roman if it was whatever a certain man this was a dangerous stretch of road that was always known because it was 1,200 meters long. And it went, excuse me, it was 1,200 meters down to Jerusalem. And we see all of the things of the world around it was not nice. It was a rock. It was filled with thorns. It was filled with caves. It was a dangerous stretch of 27 kilometers and it was always known for the robbery and yet people had to travel it and he used this stretch he used this story but it's not a parable that which needs great interpretation but a story framed as an example and needed not to be translated but copied and applied it gives pictures it gives analogies it tells the story of a poor victim. It tells the story of self-absorbed pastor buyers and the compassionate caregiver. The sufferer is a man, nothing more. Has no label around his neck to tick him as a neighbor, tick him as a good or bad person. That is the beginning of an answer to the lawyer. There are so many organizations who focus on this word Samaritan. This is not how Jesus intended it to be. He wanted us to get to the point of understanding the very first context of it. The man came to ask him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, there was rich young girl asked the same question. They were so used to doing the law, they figured if they added some more to it, they can get into the kingdom of heaven. And he asked them, back in Mark, 
back in Matthew, they said this is the new commandment, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy might, and love thy neighbor as thyself. But you notice how they ought to love God with his whole being, every aspect, their strength, their mind, their soul, and their heart. If you love God that much, you've probably given in your heart already because <laughs> that's the only way we can love him. Why? Our love is very limited. In order to love God, and if we love God, and if we are a child of God, we'll have a different vision of people. We're going to look at them different. I'm not going to look at what clothes they're wearing, how are they dressed, what color are they from, what country are they from, what language are they speaking, what's this, it won't matter. You know what I see a lot every time I walk through? I wonder if anybody shared the gospel with them. But you know I have the same problem as the Levite, same problem as the priest. Sometimes I'm busy going somewhere. We all have that problem. I, time, got, got to go, and I forget just to pull a little track out of my pocket and say, hey, here's something for you. Or just to stop and ask a question. How many times we walk by somebody on a park bench and we thought, I need to say something to them. And we don't. It's not about doing good. It's not about all this. It's about having compassion on those that are broken and hurting. What did the Bible say? That Jesus Christ, Isaiah said it, and he preached it again, came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to set the captive free. He came to bind the wounds. This is not physical. This is spiritual. We're broken hearted people. Sin has beat us up and left us for dead. Amen. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, it's good to have the Samaritan purse. It's good to have the good Samaritan hospital. It's good to have all this. But let's be honest. A lot of these organizations are about making money too. Yes, they do good things, but do their CEOs really need $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 a year? I'm just saying. Don't take the name and put it in your context of what you think it means. What basically it goes back to is the commandment. If you love God, you're going to love God's people. And God's people is the world. We are all created in his image. We may not be God's children yet, but we are God's creation. This is important for us to see. There are so many problems in this world. And the fixes that come into our mind are often a temporal fix. I'm not saying we should care, not care for neglected people. But we can't always allow a popular application, namely a good Samaritan to our neighbors, to cause us to miss the key focus of this parable. Just before I read the parable, I want us to hear the point. It's not the main purpose of this parable to teach us who our neighbor is. We need to clarify as over the years people use this as the main purpose of doing good to others. It's not the main purpose of the parable to teach us who our neighbor is. The main parable is to teach who our Lord is. The picture of the, main, the man's desperate condition as he lay bleeding will always stir your heart. What would reality do? The two companions of sketches of priest and Levi tell us it does nothing. Most people do not care. My family and I were watching something the other day. Have you ever noticed in a movie someone's getting beaten up and everybody watches the stands? Hello? We've seen instance where just this week all those people that were stabbed in the Vancouver library you know what one account said many watched wait a minute one person with a knife stabbing nine people and you had 50 people watching how many pipe people can he stab at one time with 50 people rushing them I mean, this is the way my mind thinks why don't we do something you see someone he shouldn't have got to one 
Somebody should have seen that knife, and it was not a small knife he pulled out. They should have tackled him right there, but it's, oh, I might get cut. Don't think about it. Do something. We have in a world, we stand back and we look at everything, and we see, well, our neighbor, our friend, he might get mad at me if I tell him about the gospel. He might get this. He might. Did Jesus care if you got mad at him? Jesus spoke the truth. Jesus shared his story of salvation and grace. We have so many times we have, our, the world doesn't care about people. But we see there is a story God uses here showing the compassion, the boldness in bringing this man looked and did. There are those that look and there are those that do. We look at sometimes and we say, does he fit into our circle or is he out of the circle? I'm glad the Bible leaves him nameless, the man. I've seen sermons where people have said, well, it's a Roman soldier. That's why the Jews didn't stop. It's another Samaritan. If the Bible doesn't say, don't speculate. It says the man. He could have been the first Chinese man to ever visit Israel. Who knows? He could have been one of my great, 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 great ancestors. I don't know. Probably not. But you could speculate till the cows come home. It doesn't make you right. The Bible left him nameless. But the story remains the same. If you love God, in other words, if you're a child of God, you're going to have the heart for anyone. And you're going to do what it takes to see them healed. The man is left, as we would say, roadkill. They didn't care about him. The robbers only wanted his raiment. But these others just walked by. Often the reason given for the priest and Levi to walk past is that they would become unclean if they got too close, especially if they discovered the body was dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. What does the Bible say? He says he came down a certain way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So he just walks this way and goes, ooh. He didn't look at him. He just kind of saw him laying in the ditch and goes, I'm going to go the other way. The Levite had a little bit more compassion. He looked upon him. Whoa, that's bad. Ooh. Let me get going. And went the other way. How callous that is. How callous. We want to be careful not to read too much in the parable and say it's about hypocritical religion. Or this is about what the law is. I've heard messages slice and dice in every which way possible. Yes, there's some great analogies, but it may not be correct. The priest and Levite represented the most likely to stop because they were taught to love thy neighbor. You would think. The people listening would be thinking, if they didn't stop, there's a good chance I would not have either. So why didn't the priest and Levite stop? I don't know. Therefore, I can't speculate. But if you were to speculate, maybe it was too, in too keen, inconvenient. Let me use it for my life. Why don't I pass the track sometimes? Why don't I witness to somebody sometimes? Bad time of day. Got things to do. A little inconvenient. So you go on. We could all probably raise our hand to that one. I was too busy. Been guilty. Fearful of rejection or what people would say. You know, the priests weren't allowed to touch anything. Well, what would people say? I helped a Samaritan. I helped a Roman. I'd lose my standing in society. What is he going to say if I ask him about, will it ruin our friendship? What about if you don't ask him and he goes to hell? Can you imagine? What if you do ask him and he's ready to fall off the vine? 
He's one of those ripe fruit that a grandmother's been praying for, a mother's been praying for, a father's been praying for, and you are the last straw. And he was just saying, or she was saying, is it even real? But because of your worrying, maybe they have a gruff exterior. Never know. Or how many of us have just wanted to get home? We're tired, we're busy, and the wife told us to go get a bag of milk. And we're running in there, and you see the cashier just... How many of us have seen a lot of cashiers like that lately? Smile. Lift up your mask and smile a little bit. Give them a track. Let them know you're thinking about them. Have some compassion. Every time I go to Superstore, I look for two cashiers. Sometimes their line is long, but I like to go by there. Because after now, they know my bald head and they know my face. But most of all, they know my accent. And it always, I always leave them with a joke, a cheer up, and they say thank you. Something. Talk to them. Because it seems like they're always down. Anytime my wife and I would go shopping on Wednesday night, everybody at Walmart seemed to knows us after a while. That's the point. Be consistent. Talk to them. If we break down the story by person, we could say that the priest had the knowledge of God's law, but no application. The Levite, the knowledge of God's way, but no compassion. The Samaritan, a doer of God's laws and ways, and showed sacrificial love. You can look at John 4.34. The Bible says that God saw the fields wide unto harvest. Said Christ, said, I am doing my father's meat. When the disciples were worried about physical meat, he said, this is what I'm here for. Romans 5.8, while we were yet sinners. He commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He commended his love. Romans 8.39, the love of God. Can you even measure the love of God? You know what the Bible says? The love of God which is in Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world. That love that God had is in his son. And if we're a child of God, we'll have that same love. If we break down each situation, all of us see what sin brings. Every one of us has seen br sin will bring ruin on all man. Sin does not care who we are, what country we were born in, what language we speak, what class of religion or what class of society we're in, or what religion we are. Sin will ruin us all. Lock, stock, and barrel. Sin brings rejection to all. The greatest rejection there is, ladies and gentlemen, is that God will reject us if we do not have His Son. Why? He rejected His own Son. Father, why hast Thou forsaken me? A holy, righteous God cannot look on sin. If we do not have Jesus Christ he is the way, the truth, and life. He is the door. If we don't have salvation in Him, I don't care what we've done in our life. We will not get into heaven. But aren't you glad when you see the story of the Samaritan, you see a story of restoration. Here is a man that has been left for dead. And there is a good picture of our Lord. When sin has rejected us, when sin has ruined us, our Lord has stopped by and showed us the love we didn't deserve. Showed us mercy. He bound us up. He took care of us, provided for us. And I love what he says. He's coming back. But folks, the story is important. Like Jesus, he gave, love gives. Like Jesus, he cares, love cares. Like Jesus, he sacrificed in love. Christ's love is a sacrificial love. 
Today's love is based on as long as you love me, I'll love you. That's why our marriages don't last anymore. Who had ever thought that we would be splitting relationships over irreconcilable differences? <laughs> I have a lot between me and my wife. She's a perfectionist. I'm sloppy. Oil and water. I remember one of the things that I will never forget. She made a comment one day. She goes, do you not know where the washing machine is? I would come in from construction covered with red dirt. She would get home from the bank. There my pants were. There my socks were. There where my shirt is. And there's the shower. And I would leave, put my clothes on, sit on the couch. And she got aggravated. And this is the thing is, I didn't see a difference. It's my house. I can live like I want. But that's not the difference to her. Her pen is in the right place. Her papers are right place. And my office desk looks very organized to me. I know where everything is. Don't straighten it because I won't find a thing. But this is the difference. There's a lot of irreconcilable differences in marriages. But doesn't love cover everything? Should. God gave me Lori to complete all my things I could not fix. That's why we're together. This is where Christ completes us and gives us that final completion only he can give. That is why he is our go-between. Jesus begins a story to tell them that this is how it is. What an elaborate story just to make a point to go and do likewise. Christ uses the people of the story to make the man realize that he was not obeying the commandments and he knew it. Why? He tried to make an excuse. But who is thy neighbor? How lame is that? Who is that? Deflection. This is the story I get a lot when I witness to somebody. Well, who did this? It doesn't matter who did this. You're lost. You need the Savior I don't care about this. I've had people ask, what, well, what about this? You know, what about that? It doesn't matter. It's a deflection. In light of Christ's story, the lawyer can answer his own question now, and he does. For when Jesus asked, which of these three thinkest thou? He says, with no hesitation, but with a strong, lingering prejudice that does not care to pronounce the name. He says, he that showeth mercy. He can't even come to say the Samaritan. And Jesus says, go thou and do likewise. Go and do to others as you would have them do to you. Where the circumstance reversed and your places change. Read off your duty, not from your own low standpoint merely, but in the binocular vision of God's word. As you put yourself in his place, so you will find that in the line of duty, the line of beauty are one. The practical lessons of the parable are easy to trace. The first lesson teaches the lesson of humanity. God loves all. The neighborhood and the brotherhood of man, it is a convenience and perhaps a necessity of human life that the great masses of our world should be broken up into fragments and sections with differing races, customs, language, and names. It gives the world the stimulus of competition and helpful rivalries. But that was never God's intention. But these were distinctions are superficial. They're temporal. And beneath this diversity of speech and thought, there's a deeper unity of the soul. God says in Psalms 139 verse 14, I will praise thee for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. The Bible tells us in the book of James that God is not a respecter of persons. And he challenges the church not to be a respecter of persons. We as a Christian do not have the right to be a respecter of persons. If our Lord is not and we're to imitate our Lord, neither should we be. Because God died for the world. People may be different in thoughts, ideas, and everything else but they still need compassion. 
Jesus, one of my favorite passages to preach on is Matthew 9. He was moved with compassion for them, for they were as sheep without a shepherd. Who was in the multitude? Didn't say. The multitude. They need the Lord. And they needed a shepherd. Humanity wants to emphasize our differences. We pride ourselves upon them. But how little does heaven care about our differences? Heaven cares about one thing. In Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says the books were open. And one book that matters is our name in the Lamb's book of life. It will not say, well, were you prime minister? Well, were you a councilman? Or were you a leader? Or were you a community organizer? Or were you fighting for social justice? None of that's going to matter in heaven's portals. What matters is Gordon Horton. And I can start naming your names. Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Jesus didn't come just for the Jews. Jesus didn't come for the Gentiles. De Jesus just didn't come for the Europeans or the Africans or the Asians or the Middle Easterners. It didn't matter. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. And to say it any difference, what is the purpose of this parable? Second of all, the purpose of this parable is to teach us compassion. A Jesus compassionate character that is at the heart of the being of a neighbor. Do we have this unique Jesus character of pity and compassion? If we don't have that Jesus character, then we are in much bigger trouble than the unconscious beaten man lying in the road. If we have not accepted the compassion and pity of our Savior, who doesn't care if we are Jew or Greek, slave or free, then we need to forget about what we think and imagine what he thinks and take the word of God and examine our heart to see if we have our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Look back to where forgiveness is secured through the sacrifice of our Savior. Look back to where the death was overcome in victory of our empty grave. Before anything else, we have to be sure that our character has been formed by our identification with Jesus Christ through salvation. Then, and only then, we will have the character to be a neighbor. Jesus isn't focusing here on the lack of capacity. That is a separate issue for another time. Jesus, our Lord, is focusing here on the lack of compassion. To be moved as to one's bowels. Hence, to be moved with compassion. And that comes from relationship with Christ, i.e. salvation. Compassion, the word here, is a big, long Greek word. And I won't suffer you my lack of pronunciation. But it means to be moved with compassion from the innermost parts. I see a lot of people raising money this last year. I did something and I started seeing these organizations that have been raising money for all these social things. And I noticed one of them raised over $50 million and hardly any money has gone to the campaign that he's done. But they bought a new house, a new Winnebago, and uh, three new suits. I had to laugh. The three new suits was over $30,000. This suit was $99. Folks, does it matter if you have an Armani or a Venetti? <laughs> Who's heard of Venetti? I don't know. It's all polyester. Can you tell? But folks, it wears just the same. Amen? This is the thing. We raise this money and say, hey, we're doing this. But what matters, that $50 million dollars when his time has come, won't matter one lick. Without Christ, our world will never be compassionate towards each other. The priest and the Levite didn't stop because in that moment they lacked the unique Jesus character. Without this character, we'll never see the need. Without this character, we will always try and look for justification. Without this character, we will lack the compassion and we will never stop to help nameless and faceless who need help without this character we will always walk by 
Which one was the neighbor? The one who sees the Samaritan. The one who sees the pity and compassion of Christ and fills and one who will go and do likewise. All throughout the New Testament we see Jesus going out of the way for the one. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine this week and he said everybody's focusing on the masses but we're missing the one. Community's not about and never has in the 15 years we've been here about filling the sanctuary up just to say we have 200 people. It's about the one. One family, one person, one life. Because each one of us only take up one line in the book of heaven. Is our name on that line in the Lamb's book of life. That's the only book that matters. If your name's not there, the other books will just judge us more. I want to say and implore you to know that your name is in the Lamb's book of life. You can do all the good works. You can be the best Samaritan in the world. But if you have never experienced God's true compassion and love for you, then we need to do over. We need to go right back to the cross of Calvary and bow our heart and head and repent of our sins and accept Jesus Christ, our personal Savior. Then we can truly know what it means to love thy neighbor as thyself. Because it will be a different love. It won't be just, here's some clothes, Izuzu. Here's some cars, Izuzu. It'll be, Izuzu, do you know why you walked forward this morning? We? Yes. And he said to me in his creole, I want Jesus as my friend. I'll never forget that in all my life. I want Jesus as my friend. And I was able to take my little Bible. And with my mom's help, we walked him through the plan of salvation. And he bowed and said, Lord, be my friend. And I will be your friend. Like I said, I don't know where he is today. With all the malnutrition and the trouble Hades had over the last 30 years, he may be very well dead. But I know he's in a much better place if he is. He's in heaven. But God gave us this passage to challenge us to see if we're willing to help those around us spiritually. Will we this week? Our world is sick. Our world has been beaten. Our world has been ruined by sin. But we have a plan of redemption right here and restoration through our Lord Jesus Christ. Will we be that Samaritan to the world? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. Lord, as the message is preached, challenge our hearts, O oh Lord, to look at the soul, to look at how you would see. You didn't see the hungering. You didn't see the thirsting, although you took care of that. You saw them shepherdless. You saw them broken. You saw them hurting. You saw them lost. And you came to bring them salvation. Thank you for all you've done for us, Lord, even though we do not deserve it. Thank you for commending your love toward us. While you were, we were yet sinners, you died for us. Lord, if there's one online this morning and the one in, in the sanctuary that does not know Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, has never experienced that compassionate love, let this be the morning they bow their head and repent of their sins and ask Jesus, as Izuzu did 30 plus years ago, to be your friend and Savior. That they may experience that love and share the love of Jesus Christ to all around that others may know that Jesus loves them and died for them. Jesus doesn't care where we come from, who we are. Jesus cares about where we're going. Lord, I ask you that you'd help us have all more compassion for the world around us. That we'd share our faith 
and share our story of forgiveness and love and redemption through Jesus Christ that others may experience that joy unspeakable and Lord we give you the honor and glory dismiss us with your blessings O Lord give us a good morning and a good afternoon as we fellowship together in Jesus precious name Amen thank you so much for being here this morning may the Lord bless you looking forward to seeing each and every one of you um, Friday at 1030 and Friday at 1030 a.m. will be our next service let's not forget we do not have service tonight or on Wednesday night, but we'll look forward to seeing each and every one of you as Brother Nye preaches to us the truth about Good Friday or the errors about it. And looking forward to what the Lord's going to do there and looking forward to seeing everyone online both of those days and Easter as we celebrate a risen Savior. Lord bless and have a great week.